You're listening to Philippians, a Sunday School series taught by Andrew McComb at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Welcome back. Um, We are going to get back into our study of Philippians. We actually only have uh, this Sunday and then next Sunday and we will be through the book of Philippians, um, which is, yeah, 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 it it did go fast. It went remarkably fast. Um, It's an amazing book and I've really enjoyed going through it. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I very much enjoyed uh, preparing for uh, this morning. So let's get into it. Let's uh, read the text that we're going to be going over, then we'll pray, and then we'll, we'll get into it. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians 4, and be, uh, we're going to begin reading in verse 1, and we're going to read through to verse 9. Philippians 4, verse 1 to verse 9. It says, Therefore, my brethren... Dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Eudeus and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things." Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Uh, God, we thank you for the first uh, nine verses of the fourth chapter of the book of Philippians. Um, we thank you of the thank you for the um, the truth that's within there. We thank you for. Uh, just the the major themes we have this morning of of joy uh, and of peace, Lord. Uh, we live in such a turbulent world, uh, and yet as Christians we can look uh, to the Author and the Perfector of our faith, uh, and we can just have immense joy, and we can feel the the peace, and we can sense the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. God, how amazing this is! How often we overlook it, but Lord, I pray that this morning we would just stop that we would be still and that we would consider what it means to sit under and to just enjoy the rest of the peace of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Walter B. Knight says, Joy is the flag that flies over the castle of our hearts, announcing that the King is in residence today. I read that quote this week and I thought about it over and over and over again. There's this beautiful picture of a a castle who's proudly flying this flag because it means the king is in the castle. The king is in residence, right? And this is how a Christian should uh, approach the the idea of joy, right? That we we are to be joyful because the king is in residence. Bernie, do you have a point on that one? Comment. If you're walking down the street, look at people's faces. Yes. Very few that are smiling. Mm -hmm. But the ones that smile, Mm -hmm. they've got the joy of the Lord in their heart. Body language is amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it it tells so much. Agreed. Our our passage this morning is true to the book of Philippians, and it continues to weave the theme of joy through the book. The second theme of this passage this morning reveals the source of joy for a Christian, which is salvation. Salvation and the peace of God that comes with that. We begin this morning with Paul again reminding the Philippian congregation of his love for them. Pay close attention to the language that Paul uses to describe his love for the Philippians. He uses terms like they are dearly beloved. 
They are longed for. They are His joy and His crown. We continue to get the idea, even in the fourth chapter of this letter, that Paul has very, very strong affections for this group of believers in Philippi. When Paul uses the word longed for, the sentiment that is emphasized is a strong desire. Paul yearned to have Christian fellowship. He needed it, right? And again, remember the context that we're in here. Paul is in prison. He's in Rome. He most likely has some Roman guards chained to him. Earlier in the book, we actually uh, found out that, that Paul was Paul. And as Paul was chained to these, these Roman guards, he was preaching the gospel to them. And they were, they were becoming uh, Christians as well, right? They were being saved. Uh, but yet we still see Paul here just yearning for the, the people that he has had Christian fellowship with. And he, he doesn't have that opportunity with the, the church in Philippi right now. I want to stop for a, morning this, for a moment this morning and contrast that with, uh, again, the, the 21st century Western idea of Christianity, right? So much of it is, is thought that, that we can just do this on our own, right? And that's the influence of the world saying that, that in everything you do, just think about, think about yourself, right? And it's, it's so toxic. Um, when I was down at Liberty, uh, Stacy and I, again, I've, I've mentioned this to you before, but we, we had somewhat irregular schedules because we were constantly traveling because we played in the hockey teams. Uh, so it made, it made attending consistently difficult. Uh, we would go uh, and, and try um, uh, a church here, a church, a church there, to try and find the sense of community. But many of the churches down there were so large that it was very, very difficult to find that. And my experience in, in walking into a mega church was that of you could do Christianity completely in your own individual way. You would walk in and there would maybe be some sort of, of greeting at the, at the door, but it was at best somewhat superficial, right? Because it was just kind of small talk. Um, and then you would go and you would, you would find your seat. And certainly the worship music was fantastic and the preaching was great. But then you would sit through it and then the service would be concluded and you would be dismissed and you would, again, just kind of take this mad rush to the door because there were thousands of people doing the same thing and then all of a sudden you were in your car and and driving home, right? There was not this sense of close Christian fellowship that I I think is is a biblical idea of what it means for men and women in Christ to be together in in the body of Christ. Again, there's... um, there's, a, I think, a danger in that mega church idea. Not that they certainly don't glorify God with what, what they do, but I think the idea of actually being in Christian fellowship is certainly a lot more difficult in that setting. Pastor? You're so right. Um, and we've been in those experiences with our kids have bigger churches. But it's a, it's a danger for small churches as well. Mm-hmm. That we, we get in our Good point. group and people come in Good point. and we don't think about them as coming for the first time yeah. or being a visitor or how they're responding because yeah. we're comfortable with our family. Yes. And we like our family. It's like we, we get the sense of family, but we forget what brought us was a sense of family. Yeah. And that has to be perpetuated. Yeah, that's a great point that we shouldn't overlook that. Thanks for adding that, Pastor. Paul goes on to emphasize the words, my joy and my crown. The word used for crown is stephanos in the Greek, which conveys the idea of a a crown of a a victor, a a victor wearing the the crown. If we think about Paul's life after the road to Damascus and after he was saved, and certainly it's it's true for all of us that we are all engaged in this spiritual warfare. And and Paul was was certainly uh, engaged in this warfare constantly for the hearts and minds of, of people. As Paul describes them in this way, I can only imagine that he's thinking of the fact that, that in this spiritual warfare, as he's going through it, that the Philippian congregation is just one victory in that spiritual warfare. Right? He goes, in, as we read in Acts 16, he goes into Philippi. He sees this devout group of, of women that are, are worshiping God. He, he gives them the full picture of what it means to be in Jesus Christ. Uh, and it's a glorious day. There's, there's, there's victory in this warfare. Paul then goes on in verse 1 to call the Philippians to stand fast in the Lord. Paul and Silas had experienced persecution when they planted the church in Philippi. Right? Again, the first, uh, our first Sunday that we, we dove into uh, the book of Philippians, we actually didn't spend much time in Philippians. We actually spent most of our time in the book of Acts because there's an account of this church being founded in Acts. And we see that Paul and Silas enter Philippi, 
uh, they, they again come across this group of devout women. They, they pr- preach the gospel to them. They are saved. It's a joyful time. There's rejoicing. But then immediately we see that Paul and Silas undergo pretty severe persecution. Right? They're arrested. They're, they're put in jail. They're, they're beaten. Uh, and then they're let go. But that, that persecution certainly did exist in, in that city. Now, I don't want to read into uh, what's not in the text because I think it's, it's important that you, you don't take liberties there. But I think that it's safe to say that I, you could venture to, to suggest that the, the Philippians were actually continuing to experience that persecution. Mm-hmm. right? That Paul and Silas had left, that the church was, was certainly doing well, it was, it was growing. But I think it's probably safe to say that they were continuing to, to actually suffer persecution even after they, they had left. Now, in this verse, we come across a a seemingly obvious detail, but take a moment and and let's just slow down and look at it a little bit closer too. Who does Paul call the Philippians to stand fast in? The Lord, right? It's not stand fast in your own knowledge. It's not stand fast in your your feelings. It's not stand fast in your experience, right? And, And so many of us today, influenced by the world, I think we tend to go back there. But Paul calls them to stand fast in the Lord, right? We see here the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God as is found in his word. And I would ask you this morning, to what are you basing your opinions, right? When you have to make a decision in this life, where are you going to make that decision, right? When you're raising your kids, what what worldviews are you using in, in when you're raising your kids, right? When you're at work, are, are you somebody completely different than you are when, when you're at church, right? We see here the wisdom of the world versus the, the wisdom of God, and it's paramount that we stand fast in the Lord. Not just on Sunday, but Monday through Sunday, right? Just day by day. Eric? I'm going to stand on one of your points yeah. with the word brethren, and I think... Most of the time, it's in our inclination with Western influence to look at all these verses and personalize them just to me. Mm-hmm. But this brethren emphasize it's the group, it's yeah, the church. Yeah. So now combining that to stand fast, I can stand fast and not care about anybody else standing mm-hmm. fast. But I think the context is we as a church need to stand. Fast. Yes, agreed. Agreed. Good point. Good point. <clears throat> let's look to verse 2 and let's, let's read verse 2 this morning. I beseech Eudeus uh, and I beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. So here we're introduced to two new characters. And this is actually the only time in the entire New Testament where these particular women are mentioned uh, anywhere, anywhere in the Bible. Paul here reveals a problem that is occurring in the Philippian congregation. Now the text is not specific in the details about what the problem actually is, but I believe we can call, I, I believe we can draw a couple conclusions uh, this morning. Number one, we don't know for certain, but these women were quite possibly among the first converts in Philippi, as recorded in Acts 16. Paul and Silas came across these women again, preached the gospel, they were saved. Euodius and Syntyche were likely among them, as we will see from evidence later in the text here. Number two, these women were obviously sowing discord in the church as Paul finds the problem serious enough to actually include their names in, in the text. Right? That's not really a common thing that you see in the epistles as you go through, but their, their specific names are mentioned. He later states that they must be of the same mind in the Lord. And that's the important part of it. Number three, although the specifics are not given here, it seems implied that these women had a difference of opinion in how they should go about in some capacity of of serving the Lord. Right? Again, the context of it is is in the the church, and these women are are sowing discord. There's some sort of disagreement. I think we can can say that, that it was of something around serving the Lord and, and, and what that looked like. Paul urges them to set aside their differences. I think if we stop for a moment and, and you just really even take yourself outside of that context, any time a person joins a group for anything, whether it be a team, whether it be something at work, whether it be certainly the, the church of Jesus Christ, in order for that group to function effectively, you have to put aside some of the personal opinions that you have. Right? No matter what. 
human beings get together, you're going to disagree on certain things. And you have to be willing to take some of those opinions that you have and set them aside for the sake of unity for the group. Okay? Now, we can, we can take that and apply it in a secular context. How much more important is that in the church of Jesus Christ? Right? That this is, our, this is our witness, that when people look from the outside into the church, do they see a group of people that are striving to be united in one mind for the glory of Jesus Christ? Or, and sometimes I think they do, see a group of people that are dysfunctional, right? Which is tragic when you consider what is at stake here. Let's move to verse 3. In verse 3, Paul reveals how much he desires these women to be in unity, so much so that he sought the help of a third party. Look at verse 3. Look at the first part of verse 3. It says, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help these women which labored with me in the gospel. Now, I, I was, to be honest, somewhat mystified by this verse when I first read it. Uh, so I, I dug into some commentaries on this verse this week, uh, and I, I found a, a couple different opinions that scholars seem to have in regards to what is meant here by yoke fellow. So some think that Paul was referring to a specific person by the name of uh, Sasuji, which means yoke fellow. Others still think that it would have been obvious to who Paul was actually referring to, that he was referring to an individual, but it was so obvious that he decided to use a descriptive word in reference to the individual instead of the name. In any case, Paul it's, it's apparent that Paul appe- uh, appealed to this man for help in this disagreement that these women were having. Now, it's important to note here again that these women were seasoned Christians. Look at the second half of verse 3. With Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose name are in the book of life. Right, Meaning that these these women were not just these, these new members of this church, but that they were actually fellow laborers with Paul. That there that actually had been like side by side work that had been done with Paul, and it says whose names are in the book of life. Right, these women were saved. They were they were Christian women. I don't think Paul obvious in it's obvious from the text that Paul in no way doubted their salvation, uh, as we saw that it's written in, that their names were written in the book of life. These women were choosing to put their own ideas in front of being unified for the sake of Christ. I think what a sobering reminder that is for us today who have our names written in the book of life. What a reminder of the harm that we can do to relationships and what we can do to hinder the work of Christ when we live for ourselves and not for the sake of unity for the glory of Jesus Christ. Again, I think it's important that we we go back here to where are we actually basing our ideas on how to walk through this life? Right? Are we taking ideas from the world and then trying to apply it to what we do here at church? Right? Because that's not going to work. That's not how God intended it. God gave us instructions in His Word in order for Christian men and women, for the body of Christ, to proclaim the glory of Christ by being unified. And that is what we always need to stand on. <clears throat> In Proverbs 2, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 6, it says, For the Lord gives wisdom, out of His mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Right? Are we seeking, are we carefully pouring over the Scriptures each day in order to seek the wisdom that comes from this book so that we can then actually take it and, and walk and, and, and apply our lives? And I think, Eric, what you had mentioned, uh, certainly that applies individually. But again, in the context, which was a really good point, in the context of the situation that we're, we're talking about here, that, that applies as, as a church body, right? Which is really important. And as far as the, the idea that Eric talked about unity, I think you find in all of those epistles, and even the Lord's Prayer, there, there's this sense of it's, it's brothers and sisters in Christ. There is a, mm-hmm. this unity. And in a family, you have to die to self. Because yeah. when you yeah. have your own ideas and you're selfish, nothing works. And I don't know if that's probably these women. It might have been the roll of toilet paper, over or under, right? Which, <laughs> right, there's no problems in churches today. Yes. Right? But, but, that's, but that's the kind of stuff that we want, to, we want to die on that hill. And that's just not the way God intended his family to work. Yep. That we die to self. For sure. We, we really do have to live for other people. Yeah. And so that, that's a great point about the fact that there, it, it's unity in a family. Mm-hmm. No more individual stuff. Yeah. It doesn't work. It can't work. Yeah. 
And that idea is important when you're talking church expansion. Church yes. Building program. Potential building. It's not what's good for Bernie. Yeah. It's what's good for the flock. That's, why That's right. And, and, and do, we have, <laughs> do we have children? Do we have young people that are going to benefit from mm -hmm. that? Absolutely. And mm -hmm. so as seniors, we got to say, no, it's not about me. The Lord has looked after me so well, I lack no good thing. Yep. And my job is to make sure that they have a Christian heritage. Yeah. That teaching is available. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Agreed. Um, I love what Alistair Begg says when he wisely states that we should keep the main things the plain things and the plain things the main things. As we search the Scriptures, we are not going to find every minute detail for every possible situation in our life. That is why wisdom is so valuable, isn't it? Right? You open the book of Proverbs and it talks about just seeking after wisdom. Looking for it in the street corner, right? Just, just, just going after wisdom, and it's so important to do that. Many of us would do good to understand that if it is not a plain, or if it is not a plain reading of Scripture, that we should not be so dogmatic about little things, right? And again, we go back to our, our text here with Judas and, and Syntyche, that I'm not sure what the little detail was. But clearly, the Lord cares a whole lot more about the unity of the body of Christ than He does about how they should go about actually serving, right? That's really, really important to understand from the, the context of what we're talking about today. Amen. Yep. And unity in the church isn't possible if we don't love one another. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the, that would be the foundation. Of the linchpin, yeah. Unity would be impossible without, without, without loving one another. Amen. I mean, I mean, because if you if you enter into a, a situation and you you enter that and say, "Well, I'm going to seek for unity," mm -hmm. uh, you may gain some you know some semblance of unity. But if you're if you go into the situation and say, "I love this person. This person is my brother. This person is my sister," and, and, and then that love is going to create the unity that yes, that we want. yeah. Yeah, love has to be the. To be to yeah. Put things aside. Good, yeah, really good point. Really good point. As we move to verse 4 of our text, we once again <clears throat> see in our study of Philippians that we encounter the command to rejoice, or we see the theme of, of joy. We first see this command, or we first saw this command, I should say, in chapter 2, verse 18. Paul says, For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Again, we see it in chapter 3, verse 1. It says, and Paul states, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And then finally, we see it here in chapter 4, verse 4, and it reads, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I will say, rejoice. Right? Philippians is such a joyful book, and this, this theme is just woven so beautifully through. Karl Barth, in his brief survey of the commands to rejoice in Philippians, remarks that joy in Philippians is a defiant, nevertheless type of joy. Right? And you look at Paul's life, and you think of Paul's life, and if anybody had an excuse to be uh, grumbling or upset, or like, why me, right? play the victim, it is the Apostle Paul. And yet what you see through his life is just this defiant, nevertheless, whatever is happening to me, I choose to rejoice in the Lord. Right? Paul goes from town to town to town. He's arrested, beaten, and thrown in jail. Paul suffers shipwreck. Paul has dearly loved friends who depart the faith. Right? Think of the pain that that would have caused him. Paul, who probably had a chain clanking across his desk as he penned the letter to the Philippians, still says, nevertheless, I will find joy in the Lord. Joy is a basic and constant part of the Christian life. And it's crucial that we always be clear on this source of joy. It is from a relationship with Jesus Christ. Not from life circumstances. It is from the salvation that we have at the foot of the cross. Right? That is the source of joy. I'm going to read for you this morning the, the words of uh, the great uh, 17th century mathematical genius, Blaise Pascal. Uh, I was, I was, I've been doing some reading recently on a, a little bit of his life, and I just found this absolutely fascinating. So this is a man of, of just massive intellect. He was, he was a genius. Uh, and he spent the first 30-some years of his life uh, running from God, <laughs> just rejecting the idea of God. 
Uh, and then in the year 1654, and in his diary, he calls it the year of grace. Listen to the diary that he recorded. Fire. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. Not of the philosophers and of the learned. Certitude. Certitude. Feeling. Joy. Peace. God of Jesus Christ. My God and your God. Your God will be my God. Forgetfulness of the world and everything except God. He is only found by the ways taught in the gospel. Grandeur of the human soul. Righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. Joy, joy, joy. Tears of joy. He goes on to say, and it's quite long, but he goes on to say, this is eternal, that they know you, the one true God and the one that you sent Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. I left him, I fled him, renounced, crucified. Let me never be separated from him. Eternally enjoy for a day's exercise on the earth. May I never forget your words. Amen. It's such a beautiful picture of, of a, a man that was from world standards. He had, oh man, he was absolutely genius he was absolutely brilliant and I, I i thank the lord that that he had a pen in his hand when he came to salvation because it's such a it's such a beautiful picture of of the the transition that you have you were once dead like i talked about last week you were once dead jesus christ you now walk in in newness of life with him right you are made new and the joy that that is brought in that process is a joy that can never be found in in this world if you do not know Him. We must constantly look back to our salvation and our citizenship in heaven. We must always go back to Calvary, to the finished work of Jesus Christ. What a never-ending source of joy that is, is it not? In verse 5, Paul gives the command that our moderation be known unto all men. The word translated moderation has many shades of of meaning. Um, Hendrickson in his commentary suggests that the best translation is big-heartedness, but then he also suggests that one can substitute all of the following in for it. Forbearance, yieldedness, geniality, kindliness, gentleness, sweet reasonableness, charitableness, mildness, or generosity. I think perhaps we could say that this moderation can incorporate the fruit of the Spirit as recorded in the book of Galatians, can we not? Right? As I was reading through that list, I, I was just, I kept going back to this. This just looks strikingly like the fruit of the Spirit. In any case, it's important to note that Paul instructs the Philippians to be known unto, or that their gentleness be known unto all men, for the Lord is at hand. Right? This idea of, of the joy that we have, of the, the gentleness that we have, of the moderation that we're to have, it's not to be kept within us, but that everybody should actually be able to see that when they come into contact with us. right? And again, that's not just a Sunday thing. That's a, 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 that's a throughout the week type of thing, right? That's a, when you walk into a construction site and everybody is, is spewing off the most foul language imaginable and you're the one person there that's not doing that, it's not going to take long for people to notice that there's something different about this person, right? Or maybe you're in a a, a, a group of of parents where there's there's vastly different parenting styles that are being at play, ranging from all kinds of unimaginable philosophies that are are in parenthood today, uh, to, to, I would say, somebody that's striving at least to, to, to biblically raise their kids, right? And that moderation, that gentleness, that, that patience, that grace that is displayed, and certainly the discipline as well that's displayed in that parenting, that should become very evident very quickly among those, those group of parents, right? And it's not just those are two basic examples, but that it, it transcends really all of, of, of life that, that when we display what God wants us to display, that people are going to see that, that we're different. When we look to verse 6, we come to a verse that is, I think, very convicting for every one of us in this room. Let's let's read it here. Be careful for nothing in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Be careful for nothing. Some translations actually use be anxious for nothing, right? This idea of being anxious or being, being worried. 
I think it's safe to say that there's not one person in this room who does not find themselves in at least some state of worrying about the future, right? I think we could all agree with that. Whether it be kids, whether it be job, whether it be school, whether whatever it may be, retirement, finances, in some capacity of life, we are all going to be anxious and worried about something. But yet in our text this morning, we find instruction that we are to rest in the power of the Almighty God and be anxious for nothing. Notice the means by which we are to have such a relaxed attitude in the midst of difficult circumstances, though. We are to rest in the sovereign power of God, and we are given the power to to do so by being constantly in prayer. Right? We are constantly to be in in prayer. The Bible says to pray always. Now, it's not the picture of of you're spending your eight hours uh, at work each day, like on your knees, hands folded, and you're praying. But it's more the state of just constantly being and constantly having your mind on things above, right? Constantly being, taking your thoughts and and just turning them over to God, right? Constantly confessing your sin, constantly being in communion with, with the God of heaven. As we consider this, let's look to verse 7 and look to the amazing promise that we have in Christ Jesus. Verse 7 reads, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. As Christians were to understand that there is nothing that can be thrown at us in this life that cannot be handled by a gracious Heavenly Father. Right? He literally sowed the world into existence. Right? He knows every hair in your head. He knows every detail of your life. He can handle whatever is making you anxious. Right? He, can, he can handle that. We are to be a people that are calm and col- collected amidst a storm of difficulty. And my goodness, what a witness this can be. Bernie, you mentioned when you walk down the street, you see people's faces. right? And there's not many people that look joyful. There's not many people that look, that look happy. right? Life is, is hard. And certainly people that don't know the Lord, they, they, there is joy in life. right? They I mean, they can have children. They can... They can have successes in their job, and that that certainly brings a a period of joy or a small period of joy, but to to find an everlasting source of joy that's found in in only one person, and that is is Jesus Christ. You know, what's really telling is when people are working hard and they're smiling or Mm. singing, Mm -hmm. they they recognize the blessings that God has given them to do their work, and that is a wow factor. Yeah. You know, wow, look at that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my mind instantly goes to the the um, families with young children that have suffered in, in this church and been connected to this church, right? You think of the mass with Brett and Alyssa, and then you think of the Hoffman family with Colette. I mean, I read some, Stacey read me some of those messages that, that they were sending back and forth when when baby Colette was in her dying days. And it's like, how can you, how can you, be so joyful despite this is this is your circumstance and yet it's just that that source of joy that we have in in God right the peace of God that it really in those situations it does surpass all of our understanding and yet it's it's true do you see the connection between the peace of God and joy i don't think that we can go through this passage and and miss that i think it's really important to stop there for a second and to see that right that we can have joy, that we can have an everlasting source of joy because of the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ and because when that salvation is true in our life, that we have the peace of God, right? The peace of God that surpasses all understanding and that pushes us to just be joyful as we go through this life, right? And what a, what an amazing thing that is. And I think that's something that we need to think f- uh, about far more often, that we need to meditate upon. Um, I think too many Christians go through this life never really, um, never really demonstrating, never really showing any joy in their life. And, and what a, a, a testimony that is in a neg- negative sense as well. Joy is a winsome magnet that draws people in because it is one thing they do not have. Right? When the people see the church of Jesus Christ, when the people see the men and women of Christ, they should be drawn to that. Not because the church is in any way trying to, to look like the world to attract them, but they should look in the church and see people that are joyful and want to understand why that is the case. Let's move to verse 8. In verse 8, Paul commands the Philippians to focus on that which is beautiful. And it's actually quite a list. 
he asks them to focus or commands them to focus on what is beautiful and not what is profane. We are to be focused on the divine and not the things of the flesh, right? I think there's a great contrast at play here. That all of the things that we are to be focusing on, it's not in any way something that, that we can conjure up, right? It's not in any way something that, that, that comes from us. The things that we are to focus on, all good things come from God, our, our Father in heaven. And that's what we need to focus on. Colossians 3.2, right? Keep your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. If we're constantly uh, waking up each morning and having that eternal perspective, then we are going to be joyful. We're going to be concentrating on what we are supposed to concentrate on. As people, we have put off our old self and we have to meditate here. We are to live in what is divine, live in what is, is righteous and think on those things. And finally, let's move to verse 9 this morning. The Philippians are called to put into action what they have learned and received. Let's read verse 9. It says, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. <laughs> right? Verb. It's a very short one. It's almost kind of you read that fast and you'll just completely go over it. But do these things. right? The things that you have learned, the things that you have received, the things that you have heard, the things that you have seen in me, the example of Paul, right? Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Do these things. And then look at what the the amazing promise is right after that verb. And the God of peace shall be with you. Right? Isn't that beautiful? Don't you want to go through each and every day of your existence here on earth, the God of peace being with you wherever you go? That no matter what comes at you in your life, right? No matter what sickness, no matter what destruction, no matter what death, no matter what happens, that the God of peace will be right with you. That's amazing comfort for Christians and it's something that we need to meditate on far more often. Peace and joy are the main themes of our passage this morning. And it's, again, something I think that... that too many Christians just kind of breeze over and we don't think on often enough. We need to pause here. We need to to stop. We need to meditate on the fact that we were dead. We are now alive in Christ and the joy and the beauty and the grace of that. But then we also need to, to look to the joy that we can now have as we walk through this life, right? As the Spirit sanctifies us and brings us more into the likeness of Christ, that our joy as we walk through this life and as we go through that process should be ever increasing as well. Right? That we would live understanding that we have the peace of God that surpasses all knowledge on our part. Let's pray and then we'll, we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this morning. We thank you so much for the promises that you have in the book of Philippians, uh, specifically in the fourth chapter this morning. We can live in joy, Lord, and I pray that we would, that we have Uh, an everlasting source of joy in the work, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Lord, I pray that we would live understanding that we have the peace of God, which surpasses anything that we can understand. And Lord, what comfort that is for us. What comfort that is for us in times of plenty and what what comfort that is for us in times of, of famine as well. That when we go through the difficulties and the hard times of this life, that we would look back to Philippians 4 and that we would remember those promises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.